Well, there's a quote in a book about spiritual warfare by Neil Anderson and Tim uh, Warner, and this is what it is. It says, oh, sorry, next time. Oh, sorry, maybe I didn't include it in there. Sorry about that. So here's what it is. It says, in uh, the difference between military warfare and spiritual warfare is that you're always in the battle whether you realize it or not. I just think that's a really profound quote. So, you know, when it, the difference between military battle and spiritual battle is that you're actually always in the battle whether you realize it or not, okay? So do you realize it? Do you want to win? Do you want to know how to win? And these are some of the things that we're going to be exploring uh, in today's message. So last week I said that we're going to be journeying through the, the Gospel of Luke, such a great, rich, incredible book in the Scriptures in the New Testament. And so we started really in earnest on Christmas Eve talking about the birth of Jesus. Last week we talked about the boy Jesus in the temple. And so I put a little video together. If we're going to be spending this much time, because I thought it would be great for us to go in Luke all the way through Easter and beyond. So if we're spending this time, I put a little video together to give us the who, what, when, where, how of Luke's gospel so that we can all be on the same page and really get to know uh, who it is we're reading, what it is we're reading, what are the emphases of Luke as we uh, begin this journey together. So let's take a look. The Gospel According to Luke For millennia, the world has been changed and challenged by and inspired and indebted to the Gospel of Luke. In it, he records history-altering details and definitely life-altering details about our Lord Jesus Christ, world savior, mighty physician, friend to sinners. Who wrote it? A consensus emerged among the early Christians that the author of this gospel was Luke, a doctor and co-worker of the Apostle Paul. He was known for being a man of learning, who did his research, and who paid attention to detail. As he himself says in the opening lines of the book, he set out to give an orderly account from eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He was most likely a Gentile, meaning a non-Jew, but who had an interest in a knowledge of Judaism in the Old Testament. When was it written? It doesn't say exactly, but an educated guess would put it around the year 70 AD. What is it about? Well, like the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, it is about the life, death, crucifixion, resurrection, and significance of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, each Gospel has a certain emphasis. For example, Matthew highlights how Jesus is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. Mark highlights how Jesus is the powerful Son of God who suffered on our behalf. John highlights how Jesus is God come to us in human form, perfectly revealing his Father's will, offering eternal life. Luke highlights how Jesus is the Savior for all people, and this gift is open to everyone, including those who don't have a religious background and are otherwise considered outcasts. Words like saving and healing and salvation come up a lot. Luke also emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit. Plus, Luke's Gospel is part one of a two-volume work. Part two is the book of Acts read together and you get the powerful story of Jesus while on earth and the continuing story of his followers, the church, who spread his message and continue his mission throughout the world, kind of like a God-ordained ripple effect for the healing and redemption of all people. There are significant details about Jesus' life that only Luke tells us. We don't get them anywhere else. For example, only Luke records Mary's song of praise before she gives birth, famously called the Magnificat. Only Luke records the angel's announcement to the shepherds about a savior born in Bethlehem. Only Luke tells us anything about Jesus' time as a boy. Only Luke records the story of the Good Samaritan. Only Luke tells us about Mary and Martha. Only Luke tells us about the prodigal son. And only Luke tells us about these words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Without Luke's gospel, we would not have these insights pregnant with wisdom, faithfulness, and hope. Jesus, world savior, mighty physician, friend to sinners. In Luke 11, 28, he says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Well, in God's presence, may that be said about you and me. All right, so uh, that provides some helpful background, I think. And just to get us up to speed, so since we talked last time about the boy Jesus in the temple, a variety of things have happened. So we're not going to go through every single story in the gospel, even though we're spending four months in it. Uh, we're, we're actually only covering 38% of the verses who's counting, but we're trying to hit many of the highlights. And so since that time, Jesus has been baptized. Jesus has been tempted uh, by Satan in the wilderness. And I was going to preach on that, but I preached on it fairly recently. I think it was May 2019. Uh, Jesus has been rejected in his hometown in Nazareth. So here we're really kind of getting into a section of the passage 
of the text where Jesus is in his adult ministry, public ministry, and he's teaching with authority. He's in this northern region, Galilee, which is north of, of Jerusalem and Judea, and he's exercising demons and he's, he's doing miracles. And so obviously his popularity and his reputation is ballooning for obvious reasons. And so we're going to go into the text and uh, we're going to go chapter 4 starting at verse 31. So if you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, open it to chapter 4, verse 31. I'm reading from the New International Version. If you've got the app, you can click on sermon notes, and there's the fill in the blank fields as we go along there. Um, and so also to keep in mind that quote that we started with, right? the difference between military battle and spiritual battle is that we are always in the battle whether we realize it or not. Okay, keep that, this in mind as we go into the text. And so, verse 31, Then he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath he taught the people. Sabbath is the Saturday for Jews, uh, the day of rest. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Right? They don't not have authority. He's not a hypocrite. His words have authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure Spirit. Okay, we're going to pause there for a second, okay? So a couple of things. So uh, Capernaum, so Jesus born in Bethlehem, he's raised in Nazareth, and he sets up, as you read through the Gospels, you see that he sets up a, like a home base for his adult ministry in Capernaum. It was on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was a fishing village probably at the time of about 1,500 people. Uh, a lot of people passed through there, so a lot of travelers, a great place for him to kind of um, uh, locate the home base for his adult ministry. But I want to pause on the, on the idea of demons for a second. Because demons, you know, we don't really talk about demons a lot in the spiritual realm. And unfortunately, one of the things that happens today is because we don't talk about it as much, is that quite often a lot of the ideas around demons and this part of the spiritual world uh, and Satan, a lot of our ideas unfortunately come from TV shows or Hollywood and, and those ideas are quite often uh, wrong. And this can be true even for, for Christians. But also there's another thing kind of going against our thinking here. It's that quite often we think it's like this is, this is out of date stuff, right? And so there are a lot of people who think, you know what? All the, all the stuff about demons and Satan and stuff in the Bible, they were just, that was written a long time ago. This is like pre-scientific, pre-modern. And so maybe just those people that, that it talks about possession, maybe those people really, they're just, you know, they're just, you know, suffering from some condition that they didn't understand at the, at the time. And now, and now we, we know better, right? So some people conclude that. I'm not one of the people who thinks that, and let me give it some of the background. Okay, so Charles Taylor, in a book called A Secular Age, he's a Montreal philosophy professor, and he says that for thousands of years, when you look through human history, thousands of years, people believed really that you know, our, our reality was porous in the sense that there was this spiritual realm and 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 our and like almost like our atmosphere or our reality was porous like a sponge and so spirits came through like a sponge into our physical realm of daily living and kind of could go back and forth even sometimes spirits inhabiting people and the new testament calls this possession right and so with that and then, and then he explains you know over time and more recently uh, all of a sudden people kind of shifted from that thinking to starting to thinking that basically our, our world was a closed system a closed system, and so there's no contact between our world and some other spiritual realm with God if it, in fact, existed, they thought. And I'm here today just to say that, you know what, sometimes we evolve in our thinking in a good way. Uh, sometimes we evolve in our thinking in a way that is naive, in a way that is not good. And I would say this is one of those ways, because think about it for a second. We are Christians, followers of Christ. He's the Lord of our lives. And so he is, if we, if we believe that he is who he says he is, yeah. Um, do, do, are, are we him? No. Um, is he smarter than us? Yes. Does he take demons and the demonic realm seriously? Yes. And so all of a sudden we're easy to dismiss it? Jesus takes this seriously, and therefore, so should we. I think one of the things that happens as well is that today, and this is something I think that's been gaining steam since the Enlightenment, it's like it's this intellectual arrogance, and it's called the bias of newness, where we think only, only new ideas are good ideas. And so, you know, we've got planes and vaccines, and so we look down our noses at every other chapter of human history. I think that's just so arrogant and actually can be naive, right? C.S. Lewis 
in a book called The Screw Tape Letters, he says, Christians, when it thinks about, you know, Satan and, and, and demons and this kind of stuff, he said they really kind of fall into two kind of problematic categories for those two kind of main problems. The first is that many people today just basically dismiss it and don't think about it at all. And I would argue that many people fall into that category. And another problem is that people just obsess about it, and that's all they think about. And they, they give it more you know, credit and credence and power than it actually deserves, which is also kind of an extreme problem. And so the better place to be is, okay, wait a second, this is real. Jesus takes it seriously. Therefore, as his people, so should we. Um, but at the same time, we can live secure, securely. And we don't have anything to fear because we are in Christ, and Christ is greater, as we will see as this story goes along. It should also just be noted that demons, as uh, servants or work workers of Satan, there is this intensification of demonic activity in the New Testament. So it's like Jesus is like who he says he is. He's come, this is God's decisive move in the battle over sin, death, darkness, evil in the world. And so Satan is like throwing out all the stops in the New Testament period against to try to throw Jesus off course. And so there is this intensification of that activity in the New Testament. Okay, continuing with um, middle of verse 33. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Pause. Okay, that's interesting. What you'll notice, it's so ironic, is that as you go through the text, quite often humans are kind of unclear or confused about who Jesus is. But uh, that's not the case of Satan in the demonic realm. They always clearly identify who he is. Like, look at this text. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's true. They're always true. Now, I'm not surprised by this. And the reason is because Jesus calls Satan in John 8, verse 44, the father of lies. Father of lies. He's a deceiver. And so... He and his workers, they know, that, they know Jesus is who he says he is, that he has authority over them, and they're trying to deceive us. They're trying to get us to believe something else, and they just love it when we doubt who he is and his authority. That's, that's what they set out to do, right? So they, they clearly identify who he is. Continuing on, verse 35, Jesus said to them, Be quiet! Jesus said to them, He rebukes them, okay? Come out of him with the word. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Okay, he rebuked him by a word. We're to notice that he's not dancing around with some special magical incantation or whatever. By his powerful word, he has the authority to do this. Matthew uh, Henry, the biblical commentator, has a great little summary phrase about this, and I love it so much it deserves its own little graphic. Uh, here's what he says. Christ the conqueror shows his overruling grace. In this verse, I love that. Christ the conqueror shows his overruling grace. Okay, so we're going to continue. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are with authority and power. He gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Yeah, no kidding. Verse 38, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. By the way, this is Simon, as in Simon Peter, uh, later one of, the, one of the 12 apostles. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her, which is a posture of authority. He bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Pause. So hold on a second. He does what? He, he rebuked the demon, and the same word is used here. He actually rebukes the fever. I just find that so interesting. What, what, what is going on here? Now, <clears throat> I, think, I think we can learn from an insight from a New Testament scholar, Bible scholar, uh, N.T. Wright. And I'm just paraphrasing here. I forget the exact reference, but I think it's helpful. He says, quite often when we see stuff like this, powerful stuff that Jesus does, exercising a demon, something in the miraculous realm, healing someone, doing, we, because we have these, we're these modern people, we think that Jesus is causing a break in the natural order of things. But he's not causing a break in the natural order of things. What he's doing, he's, he's causing the restoration of the natural order of things. It's the restoration of the natural order of things. Think about it. God created this beautiful world where there's just peace and wonder and beauty and health and all these things. All of a sudden, sin brokenness comes in and just claws it and scars this incredible world that God has made. We are living in this scarred, broken world. 
And Jesus comes in, and so he does these things. It's not a break in the natural order of things. It's a restoration of the natural order of things. He's restoring things to how they originally were designed to be. And by the way, he's giving a foretest, foretaste about how they will be restored one day again in the future. Every tear will be wiped from every eye. So Jesus is coming and doing these things in these acts. And I also think that there's just a, a beautiful little word here about um, you know, the mother-in-law. Like She gets up and she serves. And I think that's just a great little lesson in itself to us, right? Like when we have been touched by God's goodness um, in our lives, our response is that we serve you know, out of gratitude. Okay, so let's continue. Verse 40, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. Again, they're correct. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, right? He's authoritative over them. He's the one who sets the timing for, uh, for the disclosure of who he is. I would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Pause. Again, so the demons have this clear uh, thought as well uh, about who he is. He doesn't allow them to speak. But the, the detail I think really here that's telling, it's easy to miss, is really beautiful. Uh, these people are coming. So Jesus has gained this reputation, an exorcist and a, uh, a teacher with authority, and he's healing people. And so what happens is people start to come to him. Like what would happen if, 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 if he was here and, and everyone knew that he could you know, cure diseases and illnesses? What if he could cure you know, cancer? He could cure heart disease? He could you know, heal a broken clavicle? People would be lined up down the street. And that's what they're, and they come to him. So imagine people lined up, this big group of people, and he could have, because we know that he can heal by the power of his word, he could just like say something, and they all be healed. Wave his arm, but he doesn't. The detail is there. What does it say? It says he comes and he lays his hand, laying his hands on each one. Now, why would he do that? Now, the text doesn't tell us, but my sense, knowing what we know about Jesus in the, in the Gospels, is that Jesus wants to make contact with each one, and he's not offering just physical healing. He's also offering mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. Friends, in this pandemic, in this time of physical distancing restrictions, we have a new awareness of the value of touch, don't we? Hug, being with people. Jesus gives them individual attention. And think, if you're touching someone, laying your hands on them, you've got to be close enough to see the person in the face. And I think in this moment of healing, Jesus isn't just offering physical healing. He's offering more, and he's allowing each of those people who have all their various troubles and, and pains to look directly into the face of divine love. He knows the power that that's going to have to change them, looking directly into the face of divine love. Verse 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Right? This proclamation of the kingdom of God is key to what he does, obviously. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Okay, and the text there, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so it's significant to note that that is the first time that the phrase kingdom of God is used in Luke's gospel. It will occur many other times as well. But what really is it? So let's just break it down for a second. A kingdom is an area ruled by a king. That's just very specific. A kingdom is an area ruled by a king. So if it's the kingdom of God, then that king is God himself. It's where God rules, where God's will is done. On earth, as we are taught to pray, on earth as it is in heaven. It is a kingdom of forgiveness, of truth, of love, of compassion, of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of peace with God, of reconciliation of all things under Christ. And so what happens here is Jesus will preach things and teach things about the kingdom of God, about, about healing, about love, about you know, uh, liberation, all these things. And then he goes out and he does them. So he preaches and then he acts on it. He, he talks the talk and he walks the walk. So there's this incredible uh, integrity with what he says and does. So when the text says that he has authority, that's partly what they mean. He's saying things powerfully, teaching about the coming of the kingdom of God. Restoring things to how they were intended to be and how they will one day be again. And then he goes out and actually makes it happen in and through himself. Okay. So, there's so much richness in this text. And what could we focus on? We could focus on serving. We could focus on the proclamation of the kingdom of God. All these different things. 
But I want to talk about this idea of spiritual warfare. And I think if there's one thing I want us to think about this week and I want you to focus on and think about it when you're in bed or maybe when you're doing the dishes or when you're walking the dog or on the elliptical or what at the gym, whatever, uh, if you can do that. I'm not sure where you are. Um, just take a moment to think through this idea. Acknowledge that the battle is real. Acknowledge that the battle is real. Take, ask yourself, do I acknowledge that the battle is real? Or am I one of those people who just kind of cast it aside, thinking, oh, that's kind of weird stuff I don't really know about. We cast that aside. You know, I think Satan has done a really good job at kind of lulling so many modern Christians to sleep. Sleepwalking. God is on the war path, and so many of his people are taking a nap. Right? Now, I remember when I was growing up, there was this cartoon. I don't even know what it's called. Simon was a little boy. And uh, I can remember the jingle. Uh, well, you know, my name is Simon, and the things I draw come true. I think that's something like that. Anyway, he makes these little chalk drawings, and one day he discovers that his chalk drawings come to life. He can create reality. So he goes up to this wall, and it's like, how am I going to get over this wall? So he draws a ladder, and then it comes to life, and then he climbs over. He goes over and sees some withered flowers. Oh, that's sad. So he, on the wall above them, he draws a cloud that's raining, and all of a sudden it happens, and they come back to life. Well, I think in this highly individualistic, modernistic time, we think that we can just create reality, and what we want to be real is real, and what we don't want to be real is not real. Now, do we have a say in our lives and how our lives take shape? Absolutely. But God is the one who tells us what is real and what is not. God is the one who sets the parameters of what our reality is. And so if we are living in a world where spiritual warfare is real and where there is an actual battle going on between good and evil, we don't get to just take a pass on that because we don't want to be in that. The difference between military battle and spiritual battle is that we are engaged in the battle whether we realize it or not. And so acknowledge that the battle is real. Do we do that? That's the one thing. If you, if you take away one thing that you're going to think about this week, I want it to be that one. Look at the text. There's a spiritual battle going on. And the second thought is this. Live securely under the sovereignty of the Lord. Okay, so the reason we can live securely is because, thank God, the fight has been fixed. So we know the outcome. So basically the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus and Easter that we celebrate, Easter is the pinnacle of our faith. It's, it, it's, the, central, it's the central seminal thing, right? And so that was the death blow to Satan and the forces of darkness and evil for all time. And so, you know, he's wounded. He and his workers are wounded running on these little skirmishes trying to, you know, thwart the people of Christ. Uh, however, we know that, you know, Jesus is going to return, wipe every tear from every eye, you know, the, the final buzzer is going to go on this challenging game. But we can live securely because we are his people. So Christ is greater as these stories show us so very clearly. If we are in him, there is literally nothing to fear. And so we can live securely under the sovereignty of the Lord. And I put up there on the screen these words, Satan can't rule where Christ rules. Satan simply cannot rule where Christ rules. So if we live under the lordship of Christ... He can't do anything to us. And so in this sense, where Christ's authority expands, Satan's authority contracts. So where Christ's authority expands in our lives, Satan's influence, authority, contracts. So Neil Anderson, final thought with Neil Anderson, uh, who, who offered that quote from earlier. He was actually fought in World War II uh, for the Allies, and he talks about this experience he had uh, close to the Siegfried Line, which was close to the border between Germany and France. And <clears throat> he's there, and they were going, and, and, and they were advancing, and there was this field with this really picturesque barn. And they thought, okay, there might be, might be some, some soldiers in there, so we've got to be careful. So, you know, you're going to battle that way. But someone had this very important realization that, in fact, it was a well-camouflaged barn um, hiding heavy artillery. And so it might have looked like this innocent barn where maybe a few people were hiding, but no, this was like, you know, well-planned out, well-camouflaged, heavy artillery. So what do they do? They just wander up to it, you know, and as, if, as if nothing big was going to happen? No, they called in the Air Force. And that made all the difference. And he says, reflecting on that, he says, knowing our enemy made all the difference. Knowing our enemy 
made all the difference. Friends, and so it is with us. The difference between military battle and spiritual battle is that we are always in the battle whether we realize it or not. And so one, acknowledge that the battle is in fact real. And two, live securely under the sovereignty of the Lord. Satan can't rule where Christ rules.